Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Transcriptome of an Agricultural Pest Delineated by Oxford Nanopore RNA-Seq. The sponsor of our webinar is Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Our speaker today is Anthony Bayega, a PhD candidate in the Department of Human Genetics at McGill University. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the control panel, which normally appears on the right side of your screen. Just click on the Q&A box in the control panel to ask a question, and please make sure the drop-down menu says All Panelists. And if you do not see the Q&A box in the control panel, just move your cursor over the main panel until you see the control icons on the bottom, and then go to the Options menu and select Q&A. We will ask our speaker your questions after his presentation has concluded. So with that, let me hand it over to Anthony. Please go ahead and share your screen with us. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. We can hear you. Right, Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank uh, Oxford Nanopore and Genome Web for giving us this opportunity to present our work. <coughs> so, as already mentioned, I'll start with a bit of personal background. Uh, my name is Anthony Bayega. I'm a Queen Elizabeth II scholarship holder uh, uh, and a PhD candidate here in the Department of uh, Human Genetics. Um, so yeah, um, I'm part of we, we're part of the Genome Sciences Lab, and my supervisor is Dr. Yanis Ruagosis, uh, and with McGill University, as I already said, here in Canada. Okay, so the work that I will present today uh, has to do with uh, the olive fruit fly, the Bactrocella oli, that's the scientific name, which is the most important pest of both cultivated and uh, wild olive trees. And that's because the female flies lay their eggs in the olive fruits, and as the eggs hatch into the larvae, uh, the larvae feed on the fruit, and they move around in the fruit, basically destroying it. And this is this costs farmers about two hundred million dollars per year, uh, U.S. dollars in uh, uh, both in losses and controlling this pest. And this is mainly felt in the Mediterranean regions, where uh, most of the olive fruits are grown, and some parts of, uh, of North America and South America. Uh, and a brief look at the phylogenetics of this insect. Uh, it belongs to this order, uh, to the Diptera order, and to this family, the Tephridite family, uh, where we find another uh, agriculturally important uh, fly, the Ceratitis capitata, or the Mediterranean fruit fly. Uh, and this family is, dis uh, is, is, is uh, uh, divided from the Drosophilidae family, where, where we find Drosophila, by about a million, hundred million years, million years. Uh, and together, together, all these flies are distantly uh, related to uh, some of the uh, medically important uh, uh, flies, like the mosquito, these Aedes mosquitoes, Anopheles that spread uh, things like malaria and Zika virus and other things. Okay, so uh, we'll look a bit, uh, we'll look at a bit of the, uh, look, uh, a bit of the genomics. So the genome we estimate, uh, the genome of this olive fly or the Bactrocella oli. We estimate from work in our lab to be around 430 MB megabases. It's diploid, has six chromosomes. The males have XY chromosomes, as shown in this fish picture. Uh, the Y appears as a dot, basically highly chromatic, uh, heterochromatic and small chromosome compared to the X chromosome. Uh, together with uh, Professor Costas Mathiopoulos in Greece, uh, we, we sequenced the genome of this, of this fly and submitted it, this is back in 2015, submitted it to NCB, NCBI, so that's the gene bank uh, uh, accession number. This genome wasn't very highly contiguous, as you might imagine. The N50 of this genome was just about 139 KB, and it had about 51 million Ns. So we have work in our lab where we've used uh, different long read sequencing technologies, including Nanopore, to improve the contribute of this, uh, of this assembly. You can find that on our preprint on bioarchive. Uh, so this genome once we submitted to NCBI, they also annotated it. Uh, so the current gene models uh, have about 13,900 uh, genes and pseudo genes. Of these, uh, about 13,000 are protein coding, uh, 392 are non-coding, um, and uh, 344 are pseudo genes. 
some 2,759 genes have variants uh, and about which gives uh, the total mRNA uh, of this, of this uh, fly about 18,700, a figure that we think uh, is underestimated by at least a factor of four. Uh, so I will just give a bit of background on uh, insect embryo development using the serotitis capitata as an example here. So if you follow the, these flies at different hours post of, 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 of position after laying the eggs, the egg uh, starts with a single nucleus uh, that is based in a medium rich, rich in maternally supplied uh, proteins and transcripts. Uh, within the first hour, this egg will be fertilized uh, by the male nucleus. This, the nucleus will move to the center of the embryo and will start quick rounds of uh, synchronized uh, uh, repl uh, divisions. And about, by about four hours, you start to have nuclear dispersion, dispersion where the nuclei start to disperse from the center of the embryo towards the periphery. And by about six hours, you start to form uh, a synchytio blastoderm. Uh, the rates at which the, develop, the, the different uh, embryos develop in insects can be different, uh, and this is shown here. Uh, for example, on the y-axis, they show uh, how much time it takes the serotitis capitata embryos to reach a particular stage of development compared to the drosophila embryos on the x-axis. And for example, uh, you can see that it takes about one hour or 60 minutes for the drosophilas to reach the nuclear dispersion where <clears throat> while it takes about 180 minutes for the serotitis. Basically, sort of like suggesting that the drosophila uh, embryos develop at about three times the rate of the uh, uh, of, of the serotitis. Uh, so in Dosophila, where uh, embryo development has been uh, greatly studied, uh, one of the major events in development that has been noticed is this maternal to zygotic transition. And what uh, basically this alludes to is the fact that, or the, or the observation that within the first a few hours, let's say one, one and a half hours of development, the embryo is dependent on the maternally supplied proteins and transcripts, but these transcripts and proteins are cleared within these first one, uh, one and a half hours, giving way uh, to uh, zygotic uh, transcription. Uh, so basically, you start to get the zygote bit starts to be activated and produce its own transcript so that it can support the embryo. And this basically uh, starts at around one and one and a half hours. And just here, the, uh, uh, there are some genes that we have followed that are known to be maternally supplied. And you can see that the RNA levels of these genes compared to this riboprotein, ribosome protein, these other NOS, HSP, and bicoid genes, basically by about two hours, their transcript levels have gone down. And if you compare, uh, compare that to the number of zygotic genes, you can see that by about the first uh, one hour after ov uh, fertilization or oviposition, you see a small wave of genome activation, but the main wave of activation basically starts at around two hours post uh, uh, fertilization. That's when you start to see the zygotic genes basically coming up. All right, so now I'll just give a bit of summary here and give some brief highlights that are important to our work here. So embryo development is characterized by dramatic transcriptional events, the main one being the maternal to zygotic transition. Uh, what has been shown previously, mainly by Owens et al. in 2016, is that quant absolute quantification of gene expression performs quite superiorly compared to relative quantification of gene expression. Now, at least in the olive flies and, and also in the serotis capitata, we know that sexual determination occurs within the first six hours of development, and it is mediated through uh, alternative splicing. Although the male determining factor that uh, is needed in the males to activate this cascade of sex determination in the males remains elusive, has not been identified in these insects. So we think that long read RNA sequencing presents us uh, with an opportunity to identify um, uh, just one moment to identify complete transcripts and perform the novel uh, transcriptome assembly. So actually, uh, just to be honest, I, at the beginning of this study, what we really wanted was to identify the male determining gene, which we knew at the time was that, uh, which we knew uh, resided on the Y chromosome, and the Y chromosome being highly heterochromatic and highly repetitive. We thought that using the long, read, uh, long reads from, uh, uh, from Oxford Nanopower would give us the best opportunity to identify this gene. But we thought that while we are still, while, while we're trying to identify that, we might as well just explain or describe the uh, transcriptional events during embryo development. 
So then the objectives became the following. So the objectives now in the study are to develop a long read de novo transcriptome assembly of the olive fly, compare that uh, assembly that we have or that we get uh, to the NCBI predicted gene models, and then to delineate or to study the temporal uh, transcriptome kinetics that occur within the first hours of embryo development. And this is largely what I will present on. Uh, okay, so um, this is our sample preparation uh, procedure. Uh, so basically what we do is that we let the eggs, the female embryos lay the eggs. These eggs are not sexed, so we don't know which one is going to be male, which one is going to be female, so they are basically a mixture. But basically we incubate them after laying them on oviposition for one, two, three, four, or five or six hours. So we have basically six samples that we are working on that I will be presenting. And the eggs will be counted. RNA will be extracted from these eggs. Uh, and at the time of DNA synthesis, we will add internal RNA standards, the ERCC spikings, and we will add them commensurate to the number of embryos that we added uh, or that we used per time point so that we know how much ERCC is or how much standards we add per embryo. Uh, and then we use our own our own uh, uh, um, uh, uh, protocol to perform. It's a customized published protocol to perform smart seek full length uh, CDNA synthesis. Um, uh, 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 then we follow that by CDNA amplification. We perform CD, uh, CDNA label preparation, basically adding nanopore uh, adapters to the reads, and then we sequence on the on, on the mean ion. Uh, and this is just a summary of the results that we have. We used the LSK108 uh, uh, sequencing kit. We used the R9.41D sequencing chemistry, and we were sequencing on the mean ion. And basically, I can, let me just add that we also added some uh, tissues from adult uh, males and females, the head tissues. Uh, but just basically what we had overall across the sequencing, across the samples, we had about 4.5 million reads on average per sample and about on average 8% of the reads that we got uh, were assigned to ERCCs, except for this two hour time point where we had about 16% uh, uh, of the reads assigned to ERCCs, and I hope I will, I will sort of convince you why we think this happened. Uh, okay, so we also performed Illumina sequencing for these, uh, for these, um, for these embryos, for, for, for these embryos. Uh, 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 so we performed Illumina TrueSeq threaded sample preparation protocol. That's, that's the one that we used. When we did this for all the samples, all the reads, uh, we aligned them using HISA2. Uh, and then for the relative quantifications, we used RSM. Um, and just, just to give you, I have some data points that are missing here, but basically we had about uh, 50 million reads on average that we got, and about 95% of them were could be aligned to the genome, except for these five hour and six hour time points, which we sequenced twice. We performed some deep sequencing where we had about 95 million reads. And in this graph on the right here, I just basically give a very small comparison of, of one of the time points, the six hour time points where we had 84 million reads compared to 4 million reads from nanopore. Uh, we had alignment rates of 95% compared to 89, and we had ERCC percentages 3.6 and 11.3. Uh, this ERCS percentage is not, is not very, very important. Uh, so this is a summary of the data analysis workflow. Um, so basically we get to the, this is the data analysis for the nanopore uh, that, that I'm presenting right here. <coughs> Sorry about that. So basically we get to the rna data. Very important. I like to talk the building. It's going to take five minutes. I think not going, you don't have to leave. Uh, yeah, just, 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 we basically orient the strands, and then we uh, we trim we trim the adapters, and then we will align the reads using either GMAP or Minimap, and then we do the quantification using Mandalorian. Um, and then at this point, this is when we uh, uh, this is when we perform the absolute quantification. So basically, what we do we use the ERCCs. So because we, for the ERCCs, we know exactly how much uh, molecules basically. The, 
that we added per sample. So basically what we do is to use the ERCs, to the ERCs or the internal standards to perform uh, a standard curve. So basically relating the relative quantific quantifications to the number of transcripts. And we derive a conversion factor that we use to convert the gene expressions, the relative gene expressions into absolute, uh, uh, absolute quantifications. And uh, that's what we call the absolute normalizations. And I hope I will show you in a few slides later how this is very uh, important. And basically, then we perform the downstream analysis. Uh, so this is the de novo transcriptome assembly workflow. I will not go through the whole workflow, but I'll just highlight a few points. We had uh, uh, reads from the embryos and from the adult, 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 uh, adult heads. And in total, we had about 31 million reads. So basically, the first step we performed was to perform was to do error correction by consensus using Kanu, and then followed by following from that, we get reads that have both adapters on both ends. So we call these uh, full-length reads, and then we perform another round of correction using Illumina. Uh, Illumina reads we use a tool called Lodec, and basically for the reads that were not corrected by Kanu, we basically just correct them using Illumina, and basically do the same thing. And just to give you an idea about uh, how this improves the accuracy of the reads, uh, the raw reads that we have from Nanopore have a, um, an alignment identity of about 88%. Uh, uh, but after performing Kanu, we increase this to about 97%. Uh, uh, this is basically close to a 10 percentage point uh, increase. And once we do the Illumina correction, we get uh, another one or two percentage points up to about 98, 99%. Uh, anyways, after the uh, adapt, after the correction, we do adapter trimming, and then we align the reads onto the genome. And I'll not go through these other steps down, but basically we use one of these tools to mainly to perform a de novo transcriptome assembly, and then we analyze the assembly using Scanty, and then uh, 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 we then catalog basically what we see. So I'll then go to give you some of the results that we have. Um, so in the first uh, uh, the first slide, the first picture here, you know, the first figure on uh, figure A, basically what we are showing is that indeed uh, nanopore, uh, nanopore recapitulates the abundances of molecules that you have in your sample. Uh, so on the y-axis, what we are showing, what we are what I plotted here was the relative quantified relative quant quantification. Uh, I should mention that here I'm using the ERCC, so this we know how much molecules we put in. So here on the y-axis is the relative quantifications and the x-axis is the expected number of molecules and what you can see is this good correlation between uh, the quantification that we get and the, and, and the number of molecules that we expect to get. Uh, and also we have very good coverage across the gene body. If you, if, if you look on the y-axis in this figure B, uh, we have uh, the coverage uh, across the molecules and, uh, and then on the x-axis is basically is the relative position of, of, of the gene from 5 to 3 prime we're using align QC here to get this picture, and basically what you can see is that we have very good coverage, except for the five prime end, where I think it's known at this point that uh, nanopore doesn't uh, cover nicely the five prime ends of molecules. So this is not very surprising, but basically very good coverage across across the molecules. And here some bit of comparison between Illumina and nanopore. In Figure A, what we show is the absolute quantification using Illumina and absolute quantification using uh, Oxford nanopore, and again you see good correlation, Spearman correlation of, of about 0 0.7, 0 0.74, which is similar to what I've seen in the literature. So yeah, we know that we are measuring our quantities well. And in Figure B, basically I just provide um, uh, just a comparison. Basically, uh, some people usually want to, to, to know for, for the same number of, of genes, how to identify the same number of genes, how many nanopore reads or how many nanopore bases do you need compared to Illumina? And in, uh, in this figure B here, what basically we performed is a rare fraction, it's a rare fraction curve basically. And we basically I see that uh, to identify, for example, 6,000 genes, you need about 40 times less number of reads for, uh, for nanopore compared to Illumina and about eight times less number of bases compared to Illumina. And basically you can see that this is the same uh, trend basically for whichever number of genes that you, that, that you want to pick. So. Uh, this is sometimes important. Uh, okay, so then I'll go to the de novo uh, trans transcriptome assembly that, that, that we performed. So basically what we have uh, 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 is, is we used, we, we evaluated three tools, Tama, Tofu, and Tapis. 
and we selected Tofu uh, after some trials with all these these tools because Tofu had good sensitivity and good precision, but basically runs uh, it's very computationally efficient, doesn't use so much memory, and runs quite fast. So we used this to develop the transcriptome uh, assembly, and once we had it, we analyzed it using Scanty, and this is what we got. So our transcriptome basically has. Uh, 11,883 genes uh, uh, compared to the current NCB annotations, which have 13,900 genes. And bear in mind that here we are not looking at all the tissues, uh, all the developmental times, so we think this is a very good uh, representation. Uh, and the number of isoforms that we have in our assembly uh, have about uh, uh, 79,000 compared to the current 19,000 in the NCB annotation. Uh, basically, you can see that this basically now increases the complexity of this of this uh, of this uh, transcription by about fourfold, uh, which we think uh, probably is also a bit underestimated. Uh, so, of the 11,800 genes that we had in our assembly, 8,300 of them matched the uh, NCBI uh, annotations, and 3,500 genes were Nova genes that uh, were not previously uh, cataloged in the in, in NCBI annotations. So now what I will do here is just basically give uh, some sort of distribution of the transcripts that we had in our assembly, all the transcripts that we had in our DeNova assembly. And basically what we observed <coughs> was that, sorry, the, um, the majority of the transcripts that we had are, this, are the ones called the FSM or full splice matches, meaning that they are a full splice match to the NCBA annotations. Those are the most uh, numerous. And you can see that most of them were protein coding the next category here, the uh, incomplete splice matches, basically 17% uh, show that uh, they, they just lack some of the exons that the NCBI annotations have. The next category, the no novo in catalog, uh, here 9.5%, uh, basically are uh, exon uh, uh, skipping events um, for, 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 for the most of them. Uh, we had about 9.5% 9 of those. And then the second most uh, pre uh, common category, about 22%, was the Novo not in catalog. And these are basically uh, transcripts that have new exons or new splice junctions or combinations of them that have not been cataloged or you cannot find them in, uh, in the NCBI annotations. Then the other category is the genic, genomic, antisense, fusion, intergenic, and genic intron. Basically, these represent most of the new uh, um, uh, genes, the novel genes that we, that, that we have, that we have identified. And what we noticed was that for most of them, they were not protein coding. They seem to be long non-coding genes, something that I've also seen uh, in the literature uh, previously. Okay, so that's our transcriptome assembly that we developed. So again, trying to compare the non, the, the, our transcriptome to what, we have, to what is already available in NCBI, we noted, we noticed that there are some genes that are not properly annotated. We think they are misannotated. For example, I give two examples here. This is the first one. We see that this gene 919 and gene 9200 are uh, in the NCBA annotation. They are called as separate genes. But we can see that we have nanopore reads, and this is just collapsed reads. We have many more reads from this. But they, they basically match the splice junctions of these two. Uh, G of these two genes, and we think that basically these two genes are just isoforms of the same gene. And another interesting example is right here, gene 3016 and gene 3017. You can see that again, these are called as separate genes. Actually, three, gene 3017 uh, is, is annotated as going in the opposite direction of gene 3016. But what you can see that we have nanopore reads uh, that uh, match these splice junctions and basically show that uh, not only is this gene 3017 misannotated, but also the direction is wrong. So we think uh, this, the, the direction should be corrected. So basically, in total, we have about 63 uh, of these genes that we think we can correct uh, using the nanopore reads. Uh, we use a tool called Prappy to identify, uh, to identify these genes. So then we started to want to look into the, um, um, uh, the dynamics of transcription during embryo development. And as I, as I said, because the events are very dramatic, uh, we, we, we used this absolute normalization to sort of capture uh, the, the, the dynamism in, in, this, in this. So what we, I show here is basically a comparison of the relative and the absolute quantification. In figure A, what I've shown is the, on the y-axis, the relative quantification. For an internal standard, ERCC, 
00130 and one random gene I picked gene 8461 and what you can see across the time points or across our samples is that the amount of our internal standard keeps changing it goes up and it goes down across the time points and this we didn't expect because when we added the internal standards we added them at a constant amount uh, across uh, the embryo so we didn't expect this However, when we perform the absolute quantification and then we get now the number of transcripts per embryo, you can see that our internal standard now is stabilizes across time points and the expression pattern of this gene 8461 basically changes slightly. And then if you now look, I'm on figure, uh, figure C, if you, look, if you now sum up all the expressions for all the genes across each time point and basically plot them as bar, bar graphs, you can see the profile of expression that we get. If you do the same for the absolute quantification, here basically you're summing up all the transcripts per gene, per, em uh, per embryo across, uh, across uh, all the genes basically, and then you plot it. We, what we observed was that there was this dramatic drop at the two hour time point where the number of transcripts dropped by about half uh, between the first and the second hour time point, and then uh, increased again by more than half, more than doubled from the second time, second hour time point to the third hour time point, which was a very dynamic. We believe this is the maternal to zygotic transition happening, but indeed this dynamic, this very dramatic uh, uh, shift was was really surprising to us. So how do we know which of the two profiles, the relative or the absolute, is, is the correct one? Well, when we looked at the cDNA, we went back and looked at how much cDNA we generated per embryo across the time points. And again, we saw that indeed, at the two-hour time point, we generated much less cDNA. After normalizing for everything else, we had much less cDNA at the two-hour time point. And we had uh, a profile that basically mirrored what we had in the absolute quantification, basically showing that indeed uh, the absolute quantification sort of uh, recapitulates the uh, balance is better compared to the relative normalization. I hope uh, this sort of convinces you. Anyway, so we, had to, we want, wanted to further uh, do some qPCR and quantify, uh, validate these findings. Uh, so, um, uh, just what we did here in figure A uh, is basically convert the, let me just go back to this slide 15, just to show that the, this number of transcripts per embryo, we just mathematically convert them into nanograms per embryo, and what we basically report or see or observe is that uh, at the, uh, um, um, the amount of mRNA per embryo drops from about 1.2 nanograms per embryo to about 0 0.6 at the two hour time point, and then more than doubles to about 1.4 nanograms per embryo at the three hour time point, and then drops a little bit, drops uh, gradually until our sampling ends. Uh, but to confirm this, this with the QPCR, we had to find uh, some genes that are uh, reference genes. So there are many genes that are reported in the literature to be good as reference genes, but we found that uh, the GAP-DH and the ribosomal protein L19 really varied uh, uh, greatly across our sampling period, but this other gene, 1433 Zeta, was quite stable across our, sub -time, our, 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 our samples or our time points. So we used this gene as the re reference. And when we looked at just two genes that I show here, we see this is the QPCR is shown in red, and our absolute quantification is shown in blue. And you can see that generally the QPCR and the absolute quantification uh, profiles sort of sort of you know show the same trend. We did include the six-hour QPCR result because of technical problem with the QPCR, but basically for the five five time points we had a similar trend. And this is the same thing for the heat gene. We see a similar trend in expression between the QPCR and the absolute quantification. So we really think that indeed this is uh, uh, the, the events that we see are uh, uh, gen gen genuine events. And I must also say that uh, the CDNA synthesis that we do is poly A based, but the QPCR included random primers in the CDNA synthesis. So we believe this is that this is not has nothing to do with poly A. It's really looking at the genes themselves. Okay, so to further look at the validate and look at the profiles of these samples, what we did was to plot them on, uh, using PCA. And basically when we project the samples on the first two principal components, what we again see is a nice smooth transition through these uh, uh, through the time points, the one hour, two, three hours being separ separated uh, from the four, five, and six hours. 
Uh, and then what we again we did was to download some RNA-seq data uh, of the Drosophila melanogaster from the fly base, and again project it together with our samples on these two PCAs. And again, I should mention that for the Drosophila samples, they were collected for embryos uh, at time point 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, and 6 to 8. But when we projected them, we saw that, uh, we observed that uh, the Drosophila 0 to 2 hours were co-separated with the Bactrocella or the Oleofly 1 to 3 hours by this first principal component, and the Drosophila 2 to 8 hours co-separated with our Oleofly 4 to 6 hours, again by this uh, two, uh, PSP, uh, first principal component, just basically showing that uh, there is correlation in, 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 in the development of, of, of these two embryos, something that we sort of uh, expected. So yeah, we think that the biology is really being captured here. So this is just the hierarchical, hierarchical clustering of the expressions, again, the, the most high, uh, differential expressed genes. And again, uh, what we see is the, if you look at this clustering, that the oleofly 1, 2, and 3 time points are clustered together, and the oleofly 4, 5, and 6 are also clustered separately together. And in this data set, we also included the olive, uh, sorry, the serotitis capitata uh, uh, 5 and 6 hour time points. And again, we see that uh, for this serotitis capitata, which is very uh, closely related with the olive fly, that again, these, these embryo time points, the 5 and 6, are co-separated with the olive fly uh, 4, 5, and 6. So we think that the biology really is, is, is being captured and, and, and represented well. Uh, okay, so now trying to look at the, really what's happening during the, this maternal to zygotic transition that we think is happening between the first and sixth, first, second, and third uh, hour time points, what we did was to perform a differential gene expression, uh, and we used this tool called Gifold, which is adapted to the work that we are doing, and we identified basically 140, 1,497 genes that were down-regulated between the one hour and the two hour time points. And the idea was to sort of identify the expression profiles of these genes. And I will explain why in a minute. So when we look at the expression level of these 1,497 genes that are, high, that, that are down-regulated between the one hour and the two hour time points, so we look at how they are expressed, the expression level at the one hour time point, and this is what I show in this figure on the, uh, on the right. You can see that the expression level is slightly higher, uh, slightly higher than the expression level of all the other genes. If you look at those same genes um, at the two hour time point now, after down regulation, you can see that their expression uh, is generally uh, uh, similar to all the other genes. So from the literature and what we think is happening here is that uh, during the development of the embryo, um, you have these maternally supplied transports, but some of them are highly abundant. And when the embryo starts developing, what basically happens is that it clears the maternal transcripts quite randomly. And what happens is the most highly abundant transcripts at, 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 at this, uh, the first hour time point are going to be the most uh, affected by this uh, destabilization. So they will be destabilized such that their levels come down to the level similar to all the other genes. And we think this is what, uh, this is, what uh, is happening uh, at this point. Okay, so um, again, we took this uh, differential expression further just to classify the genes into some categories. Um, so if the genes were, 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 were detectable at the one hour time point, but downregulated at the two hour time points or at any other time point, we call them as, we call them maternal degraded. If the genes were um, not basically relatively stable across time points, we call them maternal stable. And if the genes were not detectable at the first hour time point and the second, but detectable at any other time point, we called them as zygotic, believing that they were not supplied by the mother, but they came from the zygotic transcription. And the idea was to try and see what sort of what is what are these categories enriched in. And what we identified or observed was the maternal degraded genes were more enriched in a biological or uh, uh, processes that basically are, are needed to support the development of the organism. Things, for example, like uh, translation, cytoplasmic translation, peptide biosynthesis, 
peptide metabolic gene expression, cellular processes. So these are sort of processes that you would imagine are needed for uh, supporting the embryo. And that was the same thing for the maternal stable genes. Okay? So the genes that are stable across time points basically are needed to support the embryo. Quite interestingly though, the zygotic genes, if you look at them here, they were enriched in specific developmental processes, things like Malpighian tubule morphogenesis, digestive tract morphogenesis, Heidegger development, embryonic Heidegger development, embryonic pattern specification, so things that you really think uh, basically the zygote is kicking in to sort of start the differentiation and the development uh, of its own uh, structures. So we found this quite, quite interesting and uh, uh, just basically showing that indeed we are we, we are capturing uh, this 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 biology nicely. So we now provide a list of what we think are zygotic genes in this organism. At least the genes that are kicked, that, that are transcribed early on are important for the organogenesis in the first few hours of development. So we took this further basically to identify genes that are core that have similar uh, temporal uh, expression across 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 our time points. Uh, and we found 80, 83 clusters of these genes, genes that have similar patterns of gene expression. And the idea here basically is that you, 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 you think that genes that have this same pattern of expression uh, are involved in similar biological processes. So the next thing after clustering these genes is to try and identify what sort of uh, biological processes or what sort of functions are they enriched in. And although I don't show all the, all the results for this, indeed we found that, <coughs> sorry, that genes that, for example, that were turned on like in this cluster one in the, in the top left, that were turned on late in development were involved in uh, specific uh, organogenesis uh, uh, processes. Genes that, for example, uh, were maternally uh, supplied at the beginning, degraded, and then sort of coming back, were involved in biological processes, and basically recapitulating the same events that we saw uh, in this uh, categorization here. Um, yep. Okay, so now I will switch gears a little bit here just to um, bring in a subject uh, that, that we studied. So we were trying to look at sex determination in, in the olive fly. We're trying to look at the genes that are involved in this very important uh, pr pr uh, process. So just to, to, draw, to, to, to make it understandable, the next slide, I'll just briefly, in one sort of very quickly, uh, describe how sex determination works uh, in insects, at least as it's known. So using the Drosophila, what is known is that there is a sex determination cascade that involves at least three or four genes, okay? So at the beginning, at least in the Drosophila, what happens, how sex initially is determined is by counting the number of X chromosomes, and if an organism has two X chromosomes, uh, it will be able to synthesize a protein called sex lethal, and if, 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 if a fly has uh, just one X chromosome compared to the autosomal, um, uh, uh, autosomal chromosomes, it will not be able to form uh, the sex lethal uh, protein. So basically, the XX uh, chromosomes uh, sort of <coughs> enable the transcription uh, of a transcription factor that um, that, that, that will regulate its own, uh, uh, maintain its own uh, synthesis, but also regulate, uh, <coughs> sorry, the, the, the splicing uh, of, 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 of this trans, of its own transcript, such that in the males where you have the XY chromosome, they will include a, um, a stop, a stop, a stop, a stop point here in, uh, in exon three, while in the females they will completely. Um, uh, exclude exclude uh, uh, exon three because of the sex lethal protein. This exon will not be uh, included in the transcript, so they will be able to form a mature protein called sex lethal, which, when formed at least in the females, will regulate the transcription, uh, uh, will regulate the, um, uh, the displacing of this other gene or this other transcript called transformer. Basically, it's, it's an RNA binding protein that binds to this second exon, such that in the females, you exclude this part of the second exon, which includes a stop codon, and therefore you perform, you, you, you obtain a full mature protein. In the males, because you don't have the sex lethal protein, you again include a stop codon in the transcript that basically um, um, uh, doesn't allow production of this transformer protein. 
So in the females where you have the sex lethal protein, sorry, the transformer protein, it uh, re together with the transformer 2 protein, these are RNA binding proteins that will bind this double sex gene, which is the last last gene in this cascade, uh, and it's the one that determines basically determines sex. So in the males that in the females that have the double the, the transformer protein because they had the sex lethal protein, you will have. Uh, they will not have uh, exon 5 of, of the, they will exclude exon 5 uh, of, of this transcript uh, while in the males that don't have uh, the, six, the the transformer protein they will have they will exclude exon 4 and we just have exon 5 so this alternative splicing of of, of this double sex um, uh, transcript leads to different proteins the double sex uh, male protein and the double sex female proteins that differentially regulate uh, expression so I said all this just to draw uh, your attention to one thing so basically just to understand the cascade there is the sex lethal protein at the, at the head of the cascade the transformer gene coming in next and then the double sex which regulates male and female so the double sex is very important so what we did now was to look at to look for this double sex gene and see how it's organized in the in the olive fly because it's very important and this is what we noticed so although the ncbi annotation has an annotation for this gene which includes uh, exons which includes five uh, five exons one two three four five and we know that this um, this exon here according to the ncbi annotation number three is female specific the females have these exons, the males don't have this exon, and the males have exons uh, 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 four, four, 4 and 5, which are lacking in the females. What we noticed was actually that in the embryos, uh, majorly we had uh, this up, uh, upstream exon, uh, and then we, for most of the embryos, although they are mixed, they don't actually have the male five uh, the male last two exons so we think that at least in the embryos this is the major isoform that is uh, that is found in these embryos and in the females we think that again we have about 50 50 uh, split but we have uh, both the, up, the upstream uh, exon and we have this other exon here that has been annotated by uh, some people other people in the literature but not available in the NCBI annotation. So we think that this is the organization of this uh, transcript, at least in the females. In the males, uh, mainly we see this uh, upstream exon here. Uh, and again, as already noticed in the NCBI annotation, we don't have this exon. I don't have names for now, but I'll give them later. And then you have these last two exons. So anyway, at the end of the day, this is what we think is the organization of this uh, transcript, the double sex gene. Uh, it has uh, two start sites, uh, one A and one and one B. Then you have this uh, uh, exon. Then what we think is the female specific exon is this exon number four. The females have it, the males don't have it. And the males have these five and six as the male specific uh, exons. So I labor to say all this because um, this double sex gene uh, we noticed, uh, not noticed, but we we, we read we saw in the literature. Um, Creo et al. just published that uh, targeting the female specific exon. So here I'm looking at the same gene, the double sex gene. This is how it looks in the males. This is how it looks in the females. Again, the females have a spe female specific exon, which is uh, uh, very highly uh, conserved across many other insects. But targeting it with CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, CRISPR -Cas system, they were able to um, uh, to achieve nearly. Uh, 100% uh, um, uh, uh, elimination of, 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 of the Anopheles gambia mosquitoes, at least in the caged in the, in the laboratory uh, system. So we think that understanding the proper understanding of the structure of this gene and which exons that need to be targeted might also help in designing uh, similar strategies uh, uh, for the olive fly. Okay, so. Uh, this is the last slide of the results, and 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 here we just tried in the, in the past few days one thing that that we thought was nice could be done quite easily with nanopore, and this is identifying intron reads and being able to do something with them. So it is the idea is similar to the intron retention um, strategy. Uh, we know that intron retention is one of the uh, three alternative splicing events. It has been shown to be important in gene regulation, response to stress, localization of signaling, and in other 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 processes. And if you look at intron retentional um, 
across uh, the Drosophila and the human, you can see that in the Drosophila, internal mutation here is shown in yellow. You can see that in insects, at least, you have um, a, a lot of internal retention events, about 19% compared to just about 4% in, in, in the human. So maybe these events are important in this fly, okay? And the idea with internal retention here is very, is very simple. So what you do is get the reference, align all your reads, and then identify which reads uh, align to the exons and which reads align to the intron. And then split the reads in exonic reads and intronic reads, and then perform a downstream analysis. Okay, but we think this is although this has been traditionally done with Illumina sequencing, we think this is probably better done with the nanopore. So I show an IGV uh, picture here in the bottom left, and in panel A, I've add, I've, I've put Illumina short read uh, sequences, and in panel B, I've put Illumina sorry nanopore long reads. Uh, so you can see at least for this gene in the first intron, we have some retained intron events that are supported both by long reads and also with um, Illumina short reads. But you, cannot, you, you see you cannot tell, you don't have the full resolution of the, of, of the reads to tell that a complete, how do you determine which reads are intronic, which reads are exonic. So it is not very clear, but for nanopore you can see that this whole read is intronic, so we can quick, nicely isolate this whole read uh, with a lot of confidence. So the splitting of reads become much more easy and the computational statistics becomes uh, quite easy. So looking at these events uh, in our sample, so we picked some zygotic genes. As I told you, these zygotic genes, they're not experimentally determined. We just basically use differential expression to identify them. So we need more evidence that they're indeed zygotic genes. And we want to use this um, uh, intronic retention because as you might, if, if you think about it, the embryo starts to make these genes and therefore, because it is going through these quick, quick, quick rounds of replication, it doesn't. We think at least, you know, they you'll f have a lot of chance of finding it on increase because they are not spliced that quickly. Okay, something like that. So anyway, uh, in the first, second, and third hour, we don't really see these genes, but in the sec in the fourth hour, you can see that the intron retained reads. Uh, more highly abundant compared to the exon reads, and this goes on to the five and six hours. And unfortunately, our sampling time stops here. Would have been nice to see how the dynamics uh, basically continue. And these genes are not uh, very, they're not highly expressed in the adult tissues, at least in the tissues that we that, that we analyze, probably because they are not needed at this point in the adult uh, embryo. But again, because we see this high rate of intron. Uh, retained introns, I will not call it intron retention, but it retained introns, we think that indeed this further validates that these are indeed zygotic, zygotic genes. Uh, maybe I should have shown a counter picture of um, uh, the other maternal genes. Okay, so in summary, I what, what, what I think uh, we've been able to do here is basically uh, be able to use the long reads to generate a transcriptome of the assembly, of the, uh, the transcriptome assembly of the olive fruit fly and, 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 and expand the complexity of this, of this fly. Uh, we've been able to apply absolute normalization to our expressions and give a lot of, uh, not a lot, but at least some insight into uh, the events, the, the dramatic events that, that, that are happening uh, during this early age, uh, stage of development. Uh, we provided some insight into the maternal zygotic transition and we show that um, between the first hour and the second hour, basically, you have um, a, about 50% reduction in the amount of, of, of mRNA per embryo, which basically doubles in the third hour, a kinetic that is, that, that is really, really, really dramatic. Uh, we, so we try to improve the annotation of genes, but also uh, these key genes that are involved in sex determination that might be very useful uh, in controlling the populations of these insects in the field would provide better annotations for these genes. Yeah, and I think this is what we've done. So in this last slide, basically, um, um, what, what, what it is sort of different from basically the presentation is sort of finished. Here, I just want to share some sort of experience that we've had using nanopore kits. So the, 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 the work that we did, we used uh, the LSK108 protocol. And in this protocol, basically, you get your total RNA. And then in our, in our hands, we designed our own uh, primers, we performed our own cDNA, and it is after the cDNA that we use nanopore adapters, 
to basically uh, perform the sequencing. And this takes quite a bit of time. You have end repair, the tailing, computer cleanups at all the stages. And it, although it is a very quick protocol, it takes a bit of time. In the new kit that we tried a few months ago, the PCS109 kit, you basically get your total RNA. And none of what this, uh, 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 they design for you and they supply you with template switching oil because you don't have to design the primers. You have to give you the primers for the, for the RRT, for the sequencing. And basically, after this amplification of the cDNA, you just add nanopore adapters. And in a quick ligation step of just about five minutes at room temperature that doesn't need any cleaning, you load your samples onto the uh, sequencer. And this saves you about at least about two hours in, in your protocol. And what we realized that if, in our previous approach, we we're getting about 4.5, uh, about 4 uh, million reads. Uh, but with this new kit, together with the Rev D flow cells, we are getting about 8 million, uh, 8.5 million reads, uh, really on average. So um, I think if anyone is interested, this is sort of the kit that that, that, that can uh, uh, that, that can be a good kit to use. Okay, so the feature work that we want to do basically is characterizing the maternal and zygotic genes using intron retention of the retained introns. We think this is quite powerful in trying to identify which genes come from the mother, which genes come from the embryo itself. We want to finalize the, QC, the qPCR validations. And we're working on another organism, the Ceratitis capitata, and we want to perform singles embryo, single sexed embryos, multiplex long read, and with isoform quantification. So hopefully we can get this done uh, sometime. So if you want to find most of the things I described today, we have a bio archive paper out, so you can uh, look that up. I just want to end with this slide. Uh, this is our lab. Um, Dr. Ragos is our PI. Spiros Economopoulos is a postdoc in our lab here who did mo a lot of the work that, uh, that I described. We worked together, and this is our lab. This is Professor Kostas Mathiopoulos together with his lab in Greece uh, who uh, supplies us with a lot of the samples that we work with. And with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. I'll hand it back to you at Genome uh, Web. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for this very nice presentation. Uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. And again, if you do not see the Q&A box in the control panel, just hover your cursor over the main panel until you see the control item icons on the bottom, and then go to the Options menu and select Q&A. Also, just before we start with the q and I'd, I'd like to ask our attendees to take a, take a very brief moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and provide us with your feedback. So with that, let's, let us move into some questions. A um, number of pretty technical questions. Uh, one refers to something early in your talk, and that is how did you calculate the error rate in your comparison between raw read, can you, and can you plus Lorik? And also, did you check for any possible artifact chimera when running, when running can you? Um, yes, so how do, so there are about two questions there. So how do we calculate the error rates? So this, 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 um, um, so you, I mean, we just align the reads onto the genome, and I, we wrote our own, you know, tools to identify the alignment items. But but there are so many tools. Uh, there is Align QC that gives you the alignment rates and the errors in your reads. It does a lot of um, uh, such of such descriptives. I, I would, if you want to do that, you can use Align QC. You align your reads, supply it with the BAM files and and the reference, and then it will give you, calculate for you all the. Um, uh, error rates are uh, quite detailed. Um, so then, do I hope I answered that. Um, the other question was, can we, how do we check for um, like chimeras? And again, again, um, so if you use a line QC, uh, it will, uh, this, I'm trying to give you like simple, simple, simple answers. This is, you use a line QC, it will tell you how many, how percentage of your reads have chimeras. And basically, you can uh, take those reads out of your, uh, you'll get the reads, and you can just take them out of your data set, and you don't use them at all. Um, uh, but, 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 but you can use other tools that find cameras and will basically split them. If you use things like, uh, I forget the tool, but there's a tool that we use to um, uh, basically uh, find cut adapter, I think. I think it's cut adapter that you can use to uh, trim, trim, trim adapters from reads and also find adapters that are 
in between your reads, which basically sometimes represent the chimeras, and it will just basically split the read in two, into two if, 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 if you tell it to. Uh, I hope, I, hope I, I answered that question. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, another question, um, how did you compare the three tools, Tama, Tofu, and Tapis? Um, how did you calculate the precision and sensitivity when you compared them? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and, and maybe you will find fault with my answer, but um, so what we do um, is to, um, so, you ask, so what we did here was to get the f one of the time points where we had enough reads, we subsample a few reads, like one million reads. We, uh, we synthesize, we use the, those three tools to get an assembly. So we sub uh, let's say get one million reads, supply them to Tofu, Tama and, and, and Preppy, and then we get the assembly out, and then we compare that assembly. I mean, okay, you, uh, hopefully you don't find a lot of fault, but we compare that assembly to the NCBA assembly, and then we see how well the transcriptome that we have aligns to the transcriptome that we have in NCBI. So, and then, so this, the, the, the precision and, and the sensitivity is basically now are linked to how well the transcripts we have align to um, uh, the NSBA assembly. So that's, that's how we did it. Okay, thank you. Um, question regarding the intron retention events. Did you check whether those could perhaps be pre-processed transcripts? And this participant says that you typically see some th this in full-length transcript sequencing, you would see pre-processed transcripts. Yes, so again, so yeah, you caught me right there. So yeah, this is why I was trying to avoid using the word intron retention. I was trying to use the word retained introns. I know it's a bit of a jargon there, but um, so, so yes, so yeah, so we, I mean, it's not very easy to tell which one is an intron retained read, or uh, a read that, you know, is just immature. Uh, so what we are doing, what we are using here are poly A reads. So at some level, these are mature reads. But 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 so um, um, here we're not really claiming intron retention. We're not claiming that these are intron. We're just saying that these are reads that have introns in them. And to the extent that we use them, we're using them to actually identify that they are um, immature reads to support the f what we think is that these are zygotic genes that we are looking at. So if they are, um, if we see a lot of immature reads in, in these reads, uh, we want to use that as a proxy to tell us that indeed these genes are coming from the genome. And because the genome is just being activated and just starting to transcribe, that, that, that um, 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 these reads are, have, have, have not had a lot of time to be processed. I, I, am, I must say that. Uh, during embryo development, at least in the olive fly and in insects, it, you have very quick rounds of nuclear 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 uh, um, uh, nuclear uh, um, divisions, such that the embryo doesn't have uh, um, a cannot, doesn't have it's in the literature it doesn't have a lot of time to process all the transcripts. So we know that we should be seeing these sort of uh, events in, in our sum, in our data set. Okay, thanks. Um, fairly general question, what sample quality control steps did you use in your experiments? Uh, sample quality control. So we use tools that are available to do QC. We use uh, the uh, aligning QC mainly to, um, um, to see how many reads are chimeric, how many reads are uh, so mainly actually we, that, that's to do with the chimeric reads, but on our own um, so we want to find reads that have both adapters. So as I said in the beginning, we designed our own adapters. So what we did was to add adapters on both ends of the reads, and, and these adapters will look for reads that have both adapters that we added on either end to be able to uh, to tell which strand the read is. You might remember that you might remember that nanopore sequences reads from either three prime end. So we'll be able to be able to uh, strand them, we add adapters, but also to tell which reads are full length, um, 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 we, use, we, ha we look for reads that have both these adapters. What other QC did we do? Um, again, we use things like cut adapt to trim adapters, but also to identify reads that have 
um, um, intro, sort of uh, adapters in the middle so that we either take them out of our data set or split them uh, where they find adapters uh, so they don't have chimeras and what else. Um, so that's what I can think of right now. Okay, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, we have a few more questions, but we have run out of time. So with that, uh, let me thank our speaker, Anthony Bayega, and our sponsor, Oxford Non-Important Technologies. And if we didn't have time to get to your question today, we will have Anthony uh, follow up with you after the webinar. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. And finally, if you missed any part of this webinar or you would like to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. So with that, thank you again for joining us for this genome webinar. Thank you very much.